Welcome to Rifilo's Roundtable. I'm Rifilo Moloto, the host of Breakfast on Cape Talk. If you have been listening to Cape Talk for the last few months, certainly since May, we have been focusing on the biggest existential threat to our econ economy uh, and business at this particular time, and that's, of course, the electricity grid. I'm sure you've checked out the hashtag PowerSpot on our website, capetalk.co.za, if you'd like to get into the now 16 conversations that we've had with en energy experts from all over the country. Three of those experts are with me for the Roundtable today, our second edition of Refueler's Roundtable, focusing on how we solve our energy crisis. Um, on my right is Chris Yelland, uh, energy expert who probably needs no introduction uh, in the South African context, uh, but has been working in, in energy for many years and, and consistently giving us an engineering perspective as to what needs to be solved uh, within South Africa's energy crisis. Dom Wills is the CEO of Solar Group, the first uh, company to have received uh, sort of large R uh, IPP projects coming, uh, the 100 megawatt IPP. PP projects coming from uh, government and will give us a great renewables perspective today. Thank you for joining us. And Adil Nchabeleng is the CEO of Transform SA, giving us his own energy expert perspective as well um, on the problems, but trust me, much more on the solutions. The reason we started Power Spot in the first place is uh, South Africans have been lurched from cli uh, crisis to crisis uh, when it comes to load shedding. And that seems to be the only time we take the mom a moment to understand what's wrong within the grid. But so much more uh, is uh, a part of the solution to South Africa's energy problems than wet coal or a strike uh, and the like uh, that have been troubling uh, ESCOM today. So I'm going to kick off by asking people who are much more in the know than I, um, gentlemen, what are the top three issues that need to be addressed first and foremost for South Africa to get out of the quagmire that we're in at the moment? I'll start with you, Adil. Currently, you need to get uh, the coal fleet up and running properly. You need to actually get back some of the units that are down, that are actually completely you know, decommissioned, some of them that needs to be brought back. Coal is the bad rock of South Africa's energy. If you don't fix what currently ESCOM is, no other new solution will actually be able to bridge the gap that ESCOM is holding in the uh, energy market right now. That particular solution can be done and should be the priority. And thereafter, we start building in on all other technologies that needs to be added onto the grid to make sure that we have a proper functioning electricity and energy system. The others is actually things that we need to do between now and the next five years of implementing ele elements such as making sure that we have micro and mini grids mm -hmm. that are actually created in South Africa, whether it's small estates or whether it's to do with large industrial complexes, especially where there is not really much requirement for intensive energy requirement such as industrial energy requirement on smelters and you know things that are actually using you know quite committed energy so some of these things can be broken down and new technologies can be introduced right now we're all dependent on escom when we spoke on the power spot you highlighted the four and a half thousand megawatts from medupi and kusila that are consistently the ones that break down uh, sometimes at 1500 megawatts at a time it seems like quite a huge task to start with such a big uh, demand structure. What would need to change in order, us, in order for us to get there? The, the Medupi situation, remember, is, is actually a mishap. They gave two companies, uh, Hitachi and Mitsubishi. One got boilers, the other one got uh, turbines. Mm -hmm. And instead of giving them on their competencies, they gave one turbines, which was not their competency. They gave the other one uh, boilers, which was not their competency, because it was a rush process okay. in how it was done. And these guys had to learn on the job. And as a result, they made a lot of mistakes in the process, because they couldn't change and really rewrite the whole scope and process. So that's what happened in Mandupi and Kusile. Okay. Then over a period of time, it ran up into all of this cost uh, overruns, as well as, uh, I mean, the whole length of the project itself. It went on to, from what it was supposed to be, to now what we're sitting with of 460 billion now in cost towards ESCOM and it's actually compiling, you know, going higher on a daily basis as they're fixing, as they're doing work on it, it's actually adding up more cost. As um, a person who's focused on renewables, Dom, do you agree that coal is the first area that needs to be solved um, or do we need to quicken the pace of getting projects such as yourselves, uh, like solar, actually onto the grid? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to ESCOM, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're a company that's transitioning from being a, a grid company and a generation company to mostly being a grid company mm -hmm. in the long term. So at the moment, you know, the generation that they've got is slowly being kind of phased out. But having said that, um, 
the actual availability of their units still needs to be much higher than it is. It should be much higher than it is. So that, that point is absolutely right. We, we have to get the availability of this um, back up. Um, I think in terms of um, you know the, their future, the, the critical thing for ESCOM now has got to be that they've got to become a great grid management company because that's going to facilitate everything going forward. Um, even if ESCOM does decide to continue in the generation um, market, which is unlikely, uh, they will still need a lot more capacity to come online on, on the grid. So at the moment, um, the grid has capacity for 27 gigawatts of, of new connections. Um, and that, that number over the next 30 years needs to go up to 150. And that's an enormous amount of management, infrastructure, capital raising, um, and it's a big job. And that's what ESCOM actually has to become experts at, in addition to um, raising the energy availability factor that, that, um, that, that we have now. If skills, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, and then the, the, the next part of what you said is obviously then you can add more to the grid. Yes. You know, then the IRP can actually unfold, whether it's renewables, gas, battery storage, nuclear, coal, more coal, whatever the mix looks like it should be. Um, you've actually got the capacity to add those and you can add them anywhere around the country depending on what your average lowest cost of electricity. If scale is often named as uh, one of the key constraints to getting things done and we are urgently trying to just keep the lights on, do we have the capacity to design ourselves into a future grid company or do we need to focus on that very generation of coal at this particular time? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, ESCOM's got a lot of employees, and I, I, I wouldn't. I, I imagine that there's a kind of a transition process that could happen. Um, I, there, there are enough skills um, in the country. I think on the grid side, um, what, there, there's actually grid just takes a long time. If you want to build a line from A to B and it's a thousand kilometres, you might have to traverse over fifty or sixty different landowners to get there. You need agreements with all of them, um, and then you need to raise the money and you need to plan it and, and you need to make sure it's going to work technically and so on. So it's a very big, cumbersome, long-term type of project. So at this, at this stage, you don't necessarily need like enormous amount of skill. You need the planning to be done properly and you need the, the restructure of, of ESCOM. And a lot of that actually is underway. The restructure of the transmission uh, company on its own is, has been partially done. Uh, there was a big uh, milestone that they reached in December last year where they set up their own board and now the rest of the corporate governance process have to happen but ultimately ESCOM are setting themselves up a certain portion of them to be that grid management uh, you know, company and, and building those skills. Okay. Visionary perspectives from both Adil and Dom. Adil giving us a perspective on one to five years. Um, Dom talking about the 150 uh, gigawatts, yeah? Not mega, no, 150 gigawatts, yes, gigawatts that are going to need to be available in about a decade's time. Chris, your emphasis is always about the urgency of what needs to change. Um, what, will your, what will your three priorities be if we were speaking about um, urgent shifts that can happen while these ideas are being played out? Yeah, so uh, the urgent thing is to end load shedding fast because it is having a terrible effect on mm -hmm. South Africa, uh, on uh, the person in the street, mm. uh, the poor, as well as commerce, business, industry, mining, uh, and investment in South Africa, both foreign domestic investment as well as uh, local investment. Uh, it is really damaging South Africa, so we need to end this fast. Now, it's very tempting, as Adil has said, that the solution comes from improving the energy availability factor by using existing plant, because we have it already, we just need to improve its performance and increase the availability factor. Well, that is what they've been saying for the last 10 years. And I plot the energy availability factor every single week for the last 10 years. And the energy availability factor every year is going down, it's not going up. Mm. So in Eskom's roadmap, they have a plan to take the energy availability factor from 60% to 80%. That's the, D the Department of Public Enterprise Roadmap. If you look at the integrated resource plan for electricity, it's premised on taking the energy availability up from 60% to 75%. The reality is it's going the other direction. Now, if we carry on doing what we are doing and focusing on maintenance of clapped out old plant that should be replaced, if we continue doing the same old thing, you can expect to get the same old results. The answer to improving the availability factor, and I agree that it needs to be raised, but it's a question of how you do it. 
The way to do it is to retire this old clapped out plant and replace it with plant that's got a high energy availability factor. So that over time, as you're retiring a set of uh, a generation plant, uh, 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 which has got a very low availability, you need to replace it with, and then slowly the average energy availability factor starts to increase. But to think that maintenance is the solution, it has been shown through several CEOs at Eskom that the graph just goes down. Uh, and it's understandable because the old plant is getting older every year and the new plant that has been coming on instead of performing with a high availability factor at Madupi and Kosili has been performing with a low energy availability factor as low as the worst power stations of the fleet. So you're replacing poor load factor equipment with new poor load factor uh, mm. uh, energy availability factor equipment that's not the solution the solution is to bring on new generation capacity fast and when i talk about fast i'm talking about in two years not coal cannot be delivered in two years not nuclear cannot be delivered in 10 years not gas can't be delivered in five years there is only in the short term two years there is only one solution and it happens to be the cheapest solution. And that is wind and solar PV and battery energy storage as a combination. We've seen which of the pro projects have closed in the, in the risk mitigation IPP program. The only project that have reached, reached financial closure, not gas to power, none of the projects that had gas in it, the only two, the three that have financial closed are solar PV and battery storage. So we've heard this a lot from a number of um, experts that have joined us on, on PowerSpot. Dr. Karen Surridge from Sanedi sort of feels that we still need and we will always need in terms of continuity, regardless of how much we may love solar uh, and, and uh, photovoltaic and, and wind, uh, from a consistency perspective, you still need a bedrock of 100% of the time generating energy. Yes, and, if, and if it's not coal and if it's not... Uh, Nuclear nuclear then then where would we be getting it from if our emphasis is entirely on wind solar and battery i agree with you entirely we need certain generation capacity that can deliver 100 percent 24 hours a day mm. coal we can see what's happening with coal it is intermittent it is unreliable it breaks down all the time it is not 24 hour mm. power that's why we have load shedding now, uh, 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 what can deliver 24 hour reliable power is a combination of low-cost wind and solar PV supported by variable renewable in a uh, variable generation capacity what we call flexible generation capacity in the form of battery energy storage pumped water storage and um, a battery energy storage okay. uh, these technologies in combination can deliver reliable 24-hour power why do you think ArcelorMittal is investing in this? Why do you think South32 is investing in this? Why do you think Sassel is investing in it? These are 24-hour industries. They require reliable power. That's where they're putting their money. A combination of wind, solar, and flexible generation in the form of gas to power, battery storage, um, uh, yeah, battery storage, uh, gas to power, pumped water storage. That's the solution. It can deliver reliable power 24 hours. And we're back for the second segment of Refueler's Roundtable. We kicked off with opening comments from our guests, Adil Nchabeleng, Don Wills, and Chris Yellen, giving us their expert opinion on where we're supposed to uh, improve our grid from. Three completely different priorities have come up that are probably important to be handled concurrently. Um, improving the core fleet making Eskom a viable and proficient grid company while allowing generation to come from maybe other areas and making sure that that generation definitely features wind, solar, battery powered, water pump, storage and gas any uh, gas to power. Okay, I'm, not, I'm the only engineer, not a, not a person, not, who's not an engineer in the room. So um, th these often have, from what we've seen in terms of the back and forth you mentioned over the last decade and a half of load shedding, competing interests, uh, vested interests one way or another. How do we, how much of that is uh, around political will? How much of that is around management skill? 
How, um, how much of that is around what sometimes we hear from the management of ESCOM, which is issues with the OEM contracts, right? You were talking about Mitsubishi and Hitachi yeah. um, and the ability to service those uh, with high skills. Um, it, yeah, where, where would we need to start the change in order to make those interests align? Currently within ESCOM, there's a whole lot of misaligned priorities. ESCOM wishes to become a company that transitions into all the new technologies, but it's stuck with its few current uh, scenario of being a coal fleet based company. To do the two, it takes years. Even if they you know, unbundle ESCOM and actually cut it up into pieces, you're not going to get the same results within the next five to ten years. It takes a long time to build ESCOM. It took over a hundred years. Remember 1886, that is when uh, the first power fleet was built in South Africa, in Kimberley. Up to now today, in, which is 2022, when they conglomerated it after 1994. So you, you, people have to understand the history behind what actually created ESCOM. The current situation with these misaligned priorities and interests is one, I for one believe and feel that South Africa should have created two streams. One state-based stream of energy and energy generation where there is no competing interest in terms of profitability. Mm -hmm. Secondary stream should have been the IPPs in interest and market that are not aligned towards benefiting from the state, are stand alone and are competing with their generation and given the license to sell generate and sell directly into the market to whichever customer. In between, they could have a willing agreement if the grid is actually opened up or an entirely new grid on a micro as well as a national grid can be opened up. That's one of those issues. So far, we are currently sitting with this situation whereby ESCOM is the only generator, even if it buys from others. It's the only distributor and is the only one that entirely controls the, uh, the distribution grid okay. on, the, on the distribution with municipalities. So certain things should be done right. The IPP's market messed itself up when it became dependent on the 20-year tenders that were given by government that said to them that you're an IPP with a power purchase agreement for 20 years. They should have refused that agreement and said, we, in our own capacity, if we generate, let's say, for 30, rands, 30 cents, we're able to can sell it for 50 cents or even 60 cents at a generation level. Can government allow us to create our own grid and make sure that we can distribute to our own end customer in the market? That hasn't happened. You have IPPs only existing on the IPP PPA agreements, which is the 20 year tender agreement. That's why whatever you see, it's just you know self installation where people in their own houses they are doing their own self installation. The 100 uh, megawatts right now happening has not yet taken off, and because everybody's asking themselves if I invest heavily in this infrastructure, how much am I going to get back out of it? Because you have to put up your own money. But businesses also are, are, are investing in self generation. But I want to interrupt you there, please, Adil. You're giving a, a really strong and detailed account of what might have gone right somewhere between 1886 and a lot and 20 years ago yeah. we're here now those plants are here what do you think about Chris's suggestion for example that you mothball some of those to improve the efficiency of the coal fleet that is much better no 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 Chris is misled completely you cannot mothball 80 percent of the current availability of energy I'm not, I'm not You're suggesting going to create a miss it's going to create a mess in the economy market I'm not, in terms of energy I'm not suggesting for one minute that we switch off 80% of the coal now. I was going to ask actually, one so which, which are the ones that are the least efficient that we could let go of? Well, you have to start and look at the older ones. I mean, uh, the, the one that has been identified and is already being step by step decommissioned is Kamati Power Station. Okay. But there are others, Hrutflay, Hendrina, and one or two others. These are very old, poorly performing plant. They're inefficient, they're illegal. They do How many power plants are in ESCO? I forget exactly, but so probably 15, about 15, 15 to 16, prob right? Probably. So if you decommission already, by your view, five, five of those power stations, which are generating in excess of what right now? About eight? You're wrong. Let me tell you why. Because those are very old power stations and they're very small power stations. The new power stations are very big power stations. So by decommissioning, you know, three or four of the old power stations, you're not uh, reducing the output by 30, 40 percent. You're only reducing it by no, I didn't say 40. I'm saying when you remove 8,000 megawatts out of the grid, right? I'm not suggesting that. Because decommissioning means you're taking out out of the grid, the and it's going to cause us a problem. Old power stations do not account for my the view. Actually, to, to enter on what uh, Chris is saying, my view is simple. 
instead of decommissioning, go what the IRP route says. Go in and improve the element of your one, your emissions, mm -hmm. put in hella technology, high efficiency, low emissions in there and ensure that that coal functions properly. Refurbish instead of, as they say, maintenance, maintenance, mm -hmm. refurbish that entire plan, rebuild it up and make sure that it operates at its most efficient level. Then you don't lose uh, what you call a gigawatts out of the grid. You add on and you make sure that you improve the efficiencies and performance of the plant. That's the one way to do it. The secondary way is what Chris was alluding to is completely misguided. You cannot have only wind and battery as well as solar in the grid and you tell me that you're going to perform 100%. No, I'm, not saying, that. That. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. You guess you will get. No, 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 but he didn't on the say guess side he... of it. No, no, I'm, I, I listen to his view, okay? On the guess side of it, yes, you would have now a base load solution. Yes. But on the alternative solution part of it, he says, you know, coal is intermittent. There is no intermittency in coal. It is the power plants and the units that are breaking down that needs to be maintained and needs to be given priority. Right now, they have not been maintained and been brought into. So I, I, I get his views that, yes, we must all get to the point where we say we are excited about the new technology, but it's not the reality in the energy market. Can I challenge you both? So one of the guests that we had in June on uh, the power spot is uh, Shamil Ismail. He's a, uh, he wrote the Prima Research Report for ESCOM where he went in and, and did a lot of assessment. And I want to quote something that he says, right? So uh, for him, the lack of skill and experience uh, better explain ESCOM's poor performance than the lack of maintenance or the age of plants. He goes on to say there are only three plants that, are, that can be classified as aged. These might be the ones that you're referring to. Um, and this notion that we've, not, we've got aging coal plants is not true. They're doing maintenance, but the operation is not up to standard. He says the explosion at Madupi was staff error. Um, and he also goes on to say in the past, I think he said in the past two years, uh, age has not been the issue. It's been human error. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe, while we're getting around each other's ideas about the, the Meridian Report, right? I, I think so. It He's is from Pima Research. Report, yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the human capital element of it. Um, our listeners are constantly uh, phone in with anecdotal evidence saying, I, got, I know a guy, cousin, my, my son in law, um, I'll throw in their daughter in law as well, who's an engineer and has moved to Dubai because it's, there's so much better opportunities. Sure. It's impossible to get my work done here. Um, I don't have the support. Janaid, um, goes on to say that, you know, ESCOM used to be a blue chip employer of choice where engineers aspire to go and that's actually where we should return to. No, I'm going to give you a perspective here because you've been a part of um, assisting government with the REIT program back in, up until 2015 and so maybe you've got a perspective on engineering skill that's out there or that we might, uh, if, do you feel that it's more of a skills issue uh, or is it definitely about the hardware and the operations? I think within within ESCOM, um, it's, I think it's been quite clear and quite well documented that they've lost a lot of skills. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the past, ESCOM used to be a company that not only maintained all their infrastructure, but they used to build all their own infrastructure, all the substations, the plants, everything. They acted as main contractor for all of those. Um, so that's that's the company that, that we had. The company that we've got, I think, is quite different. Um, the skills migration outside of South Africa is scary. Mm -hmm. um, so that's certainly part of it, um, and I think that's where. Um, but it's also it's a big responsibility for one company to have um, to look after the whole energy system for a whole country because every company goes through tough times, you know, um, and and not state-owned companies. I mean, if you look at a company like Nokia, for example, between 2007 and 2013, it, it, it entirely changed because somebody brought out a cell phone that had a that had a touch screen, and that basically kind of ended that that that, that whole business. So. Technology and the disruption can happen to anybody, and it's definitely happened to ESCOM, um, and through partially some faults of their own, and also partially not due to anything. I think any utility, um, the way they were run in the last 20 years has changed completely. Mm. Um, so the skills, um, you know, ESCOM doesn't have to have all of its own skills any longer. The skills are now being brought in from outside. Um, and that's where the, the private side of the market and, and, the, and the public side of the market needs to sort of come together. Mm -hmm. And REAP was, was an excellent program 
um, when it started, it was, it was too expensive, as you, as you pointed out, and then the cost came down once the, um, once the well, actually, the, just the cost of equipment really dropped a lot and the scale came through, and everybody knew what they were doing. Um, and I think if that program had continued going, we would be in a much better position now. Um, but obviously we had a couple of years where that actually, that actually stopped and so we actually had a generation shortfall, which is really what, we, what we're sitting with now on top of the maintenance issues that we've got. Chris, your thought on skills? Skills is definitely a problem with an Eskom. I was at an Eskom meeting just the other day where the CEO um, said that the level of skills is a really serious problem. Uh, but that's not the only problem that they have. There are multiple problems. They have financial problems. They have mm. operation, plant operational problems. They have environmental problems. They have structural problems. Uh, so the skills is one of the, one of the issues, for sure. Uh, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is that maintenance and improving the energy availability factor is a wonderful dream. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It has been damaged over operated, wrongly operated, where maintenance has been skipped. It's like taking a car and skipping the maintenance, you know, for three or four or five of its service periods and you, you damage the car and you need a workhorse, but you've got an old damaged car. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, you need to replace that with a workhorse. And um, you need to replace it uh, with uh, something that is the right price, that is, uh, meets the emission requirements of the law, that uh, can uh, meet South Africa's commitments for climate change, in other words, reduce carbon emissions, and also uh, provide reliable power. And the myth that uh, this can only be power done by nuclear and coal uh, is before our very eyes today. Okay. Uh, that is not reliable. And uh, what can be done today uh, is to supply 24 hour reliable uh, electricity with a blend of technologies that uh, does meet carbon emission reductions, has got the least water usage, creates the most jobs, and it uh, reduces uh, uh, carbon dioxide as well as other emissions like sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, uh, particulate emissions, which are particular problems related to coal. It also doesn't have this high level waste problem uh, of nuclear. So there are solutions. I just want to say this. People often say we have this natural resource, this coal legacy, God given, we must use it. Well, we also have a lot of asbestos in South Africa, mm. plenty of it, but we decided that there are cheaper, better solutions. And the best place to leave asbestos is in the ground where it belongs. And the same applies to coal. Some final thoughts here, because regardless of what I agree with her on the table, mm. every one of these are big and in many respects tough calls. Um, they're clear ideas, they seem obvious, but we haven't been implemented for 15 years. Again, I want to bring back to competing vested interests. And to make those tough calls it takes leadership. Two questions, and you can choose which of those you want to answer, if not, if not both. Do we have the appropriate leadership in ESCOM? And I take that from the C-suites to the board, okay, to, to make these tough calls. Um, and do we have the appropriate political will to not be protectionist around jobs or sectors while at the same time consider that there is going to be a handover between moving from coal jobs to other technology jobs and we need to be considerate of that. So I put that question to each of you because the way forward will be about the leadership that's out there, finding the skills, making the tough calls. Um, welcome to answer both or either. Do? Yeah, I think the, the, the one aspect of leadership that we haven't touched on so much is outside of ESCOM and, and the, the, um, the sort of one of the hot sort of topics, you know, always at the moment is, is policy certainty and we've heard ab about that and um, what, in, in, what practically happens in the energy sector is that policy certainty is as important as anywhere else and in this particular case 
some of the, the government's policies that they've actually put in, one is the integrated resource plan and the other one is the, is the private 100 megawatt um, uh, res legislation that obviously came through. Those are brilliant pieces of legislation and they just need to be given some time mm -hmm. to actually um, happen. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at um, uh, an, another bit of policy that's been floated, which is also, you know, excellent, is going to be this whole um, aspect where the grid becomes independent, it becomes an energy trading market, and everyone can buy and sell into that. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we haven't really touched on all that much, and that's that's the thing that in the next, you know, it's, it's got to it's got to become reality in the next few years, but it's it's going to pave the way for the next 30 years of um, of generation, like secure generation of all types, being able to kind of work together in such a way that the government doesn't have to be the sole person providing power for every South African. It's totally distributed. Lots of people can play. Um, South African companies can play, and it, it, the capex isn't so big that you need foreign companies. Everyone can can sort of partake in the energy market, um, and you do it according to the guidelines that are in the integrated resource plan, which is supposed to give us the best um, cost of, of of electricity, taking into account all the all the constraints um, that are there, and um, and that that leadership, I think, is actually there. But you know, people want load shedding to end tomorrow, mm -hmm. and that's where the difficulty is coming in because the the policy actually is starting to unfold. But like any infrastructure, you want to build a port or a road, you know, it takes years, you know, yeah. it does take years. So there's going to be no end to load shedding over the next three to four years. It will still be a, a part of us. Sure. But at least we should be safe in the knowledge that the policies are right now. The, the, the solutions will certainly come. Are they being implemented? There's, the, there's the often doubt amongst the lay people. There's <coughs> often doubt that they yeah. really that the RRP is being validly implemented yeah. and at a pace that it should be. That's the most important part of it. If we all focused on the IRP, we all took time. I mean, if I tell you what all of us as civil society, as government, when they introduced the first IRP 2018, mm -hmm. I think uh, we all participated. When the IRP came out, we all felt that they needed to be input, and over 6,900 inputs were given. Documents this thick in size, right, by independent people in the market. What came out as a consolidated, now uh, IRP, it reflected what was supposed to be, which is not yet the case right now. Nobody has implemented the IRP in its nature, in its form, in the way it should have been done. And now you have this bullying again coming out of the Greenies, the renewables, who are saying nothing to do with coal should be implemented with regards to IRP. Nothing to do with nuclear should be implemented, which is a very selfish point of view. Are they saying that? I don't yes, know. it's actually been pushing. Even the pushback right now to implement gas as in terms of the risk mitigation program right now, which was actually given 2,000 in terms of gas, particularly I think it was 1,200 for gas. That pushback is regarding the fact that the renewables and green uh, you know, uh, lobbyists in South Africa are dominating the entire policy space and to points where they have so much of money, they can actually breathe down onto government and decision makers. So it's a very unfair place. If you're saying we have an IRP and the IRP states clearly that there should be coal and it should be improved, even though it is reduced, there should be renewables and it should be increased, there should be, uh, what do you call it, uh, battery storage and it should be managed. Why are we having a problem whereby all of those things are implemented? Instead, there's only one push that says we must only focus on gas, uh, we must only focus on wind and solar, not even gas. So the issues are very big. And we need to get to the bottom of solving those issues by making sure that our leadership understands. You cannot do away with coal. You cannot do away with nuclear. You can actually increase. Whether it's the years that it takes to build up these things is a very important thing. The report that you actually specified on when it spoke about the skills, it is a very important report and it's actually one of the most clearer reports that has come out that speaks about the problems of ESCOM. And skills is a big thing. A lot of our skills have migrated to any, uh, uh, have actually been exported elsewhere. We don't have the skills. In the nuclear side of it, in the coal side of it, plants, a lot of our people are sitting in a a Southeast Asia right now in terms of the uh, coal side of uh, skills. They're sitting all over the world, in America and everywhere. You have people who actually have left ESCOM out of sheer frustration in the way things were done. Mm -hmm. Some of them were told to do things that they had moral conviction against. They were told, no, instead of doing this, sabotage this process so that you can do it. And a lot of people had moral, uh, what do you call it, a contradiction in their own place and says, but why must I do things that are anti my own conviction of what is right and wrong? So there's quite a lot of things. It can be improved. I would think that what I said, that there must be two streams. One, there must be the public sector stream, ESCOM. Then there must be the independent 
uh, power producer stream that is entirely independent and self-regulated by its own uh, you know regulator body that specifies licensing specifies what can be done and actually creates a framework by which new grid can be built because with regards to renewables okay. you cannot you cannot run a renewable solution on large scale like as in south africa's long distance transmission lines it has to be run in an immediate environment the only way you can do that is when you bring in gas and right now green and renewable solutions do not look at gas as the most green and alternative solution so that is just so, one part of it so i'm so i'm sadly i'm sadly actually taken back when i hear chris saying that coal you know, we all have, we all say we have this re, uh, what do you call it incredible resource which is coal, and yet coal is doing no. all of these technologies we're talking about are made out of coal. You go and see how uh, you know uh, smelter uh, how they smelt to produce solar. It's coal based. How they in, what is actually included thirty percent of that is actually a coal material to make sure that you have the ingots that creates the solar wafer that we use to put into our rooftop. So I know the whole solar technology. I've been through the most extensive training throughout this country and in China. I, I think solar. everybody at this table except for so, me has. Yeah. But these so, are closing thoughts on leadership now. So, the leadership for me yeah. is the critical part of it if leadership said guys let's not be emotional let's focus on what the plan says the plan says let's roll out one two three and let's focus on it you would have a less disruption in south africa it's clear it's detailed in plans on how to go about implementing the solutions okay so i you know of all the, and in the past, but these 16 conversations that we've had so far are not the only ones I've had on energy. And in every single conversation I've had with anyone in photovoltaic, wind, professors, coal-driven people, I've never heard a single one of them say, remove coal altogether, Correct. remove gas altogether, including Chris. Chris I've, I've heard everybody say that photovoltaic and wind power are complementary uh, to a buckling system right so only under 4000 megawatts are ever scheduled shutdowns it's like mostly closer to 17000 13 to 15000 megawatts that are unscheduled so something's cracking and it needs help but i've never heard anybody say kill coal but i on a leadership front what i have heard, what i have seen seem to see is actually the, the the most powerful voice in the room is, is the legislative one with a beautiful plan in front of it, the implementation is not happening. So that's that's the conversation I'm trying to to get to. So so I'll, I'll probably to ideal chagrin give you the closing <laughs> perspective on what needs to shift in leadership mm -hmm. for us to get to this place where all three of you have a contribution to make to the same grid um, in a complementary manner. Yeah, to start off with Eskom leadership, if you asked that question. Mm -hmm. At the board, I think the board of Eskom is severely depleted. Okay. They are down to six external directors. They should have 15. <laughs> there's a problem. Uh, there, there's a natural attrition and the Minister of Public Enterprises has not been replacing the board and that is a leadership problem at DPE level because he's responsible for making mm. sure that the board is appointed with competent people and it's down to six people. So there is a problem at the board oversight level uh, and at the uh, DPE in terms of its responsibility to make sure that that board is properly capacitated. In terms of the leadership of Eskom at the CEO level, there's a lot of criticism backwards and forwards. My personal view is that changing the CEO at this point now, while we have stage six load shedding, it's not going to solve stage six load shedding. Mm -hmm. And I think one could do more damage than good. Now, look, the CEO is where the buck stops and he has to be accountable and take responsibility. But I am worried that if you replace the CEO now and the board now, we are in at a very high risk situation in South Africa because it takes some years for a new CEO to get his feet on the ground and for the new board to get their feet on the ground. Normally with a board, you change half the board and then you have the continuity of the other half and then you, in, in due course, change the other half so that there's always an institutional memory of mm. where we are. When you're down to six members and you change the board, you have a problem. When you change the CEO, you have a problem. And I'm just saying we need to be pragmatic and understand what we are trying to achieve. Right now, I don't think that changing the leadership at Eskom 
from the board and the CEO at the same time now in the midst of a crisis is in our interest. But now let me get to political leadership. But, 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 but you could bolster the leadership. So as I understand it, our current CEO is not an engineer, electrical engineer, for example. You could have people on the board with that critical skill that have, can give him the oversight and support, perhaps. In my view with a CEO, you don't have to be an engineer to be a CEO. A CEO can be an engineer, of course. Uh, but the role of the CEO is not the role of an engineer. Mm. The role of the CEO is to build a team of competent people around him, and has he including engineers, including accountants, including lawyers, including HR people. In other words, the, the executive team of ESCOM is this thing that the, the CEO has got to build a trusted competent team which would include engineers in charge of generation transmission and distribution but also somebody from HR from legal uh, from admin uh, that's the role of, of the CEO and the CEO has got to inspire this team right down through the organization with a vision that's what I see a CEO is not about being an engineer but it, a CEO can be an engineer but it's because a CEO is not an engineer is, is there are many top CEOs of engineering companies of this world that are not an engineer, but they know how to build a team. What is the vision? Because when he came into uh, his leadership role 2018-19, the vision then was 18 to 24 months and no more load shedding. And he had had some time to settle. Um, and, and what is happening with the bringing the team together? Or do you feel, because you were going to speak on political will, um, do you feel that uh, that is in his way. I feel he's got a wide berth to operate from. I don't think he's bothered by politicians much. So, f first of all, I think one of the problems in his two and a half year period in office at the moment has been this undue focus driven by the IRP and the, uh, the roadmap from the DPE to increase the energy availability factor by doing more maintenance. I think that's a fundamentally misguided and it was a wrong approach because whilst they've been focusing on that for two years, it hasn't been working. The energy availability factor is declining because you can fix old bugger up plant. <laughs> you have to start replacing them. But there are different views on the side. Wait, of the table. I just want to say one thing, please, if you were. The solution comes from new generation capacity that performs like new generation capacity, mm -hmm. and that is not in his hands. His hands are tied behind his back, mm -hmm. and new generation capacity is in the hands of the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy and the IPP office. The Rater has no powers to procure new generation capacity, none whatsoever. What he's doing right now, he's done something very smart. He's taken 4,000 hectares of Eskom land right there at these old power stations like Kamati, etc. He's leased them out to the private sector to develop 100 megawatt plants that are just below the licensing threshold. So it cuts out a lot of red tape and it's enabled 1,800 megawatts of new generation capacity to come on the stream in two years. That's the solution. The solution is not going to come from Eskom building new coal power stations or anybody building new coal stations. You cannot even finance them. It's not going to come in the next two years from nuclear. It takes 10 years to build a nuclear power plant. People talk about small modular reactors. There are no commercially operating licensed small modular reactors on land delivering, delivering commercial power into the grid at the moment. Everybody, you can read all what you like, is a 10-year horizon to get to that stage. Mm. We haven't, it's not licensed in South Africa and, and in, in other countries of the world. So, China is operating, China is operating as SMR, it's a small it's, it's modular reactor. It's only a pilot. It's only a pilot. It's already doing it's it. Not so. a, it's not a commercial, it's a pilot, okay? They're piloting it. Agreed. So oh, yes. you, yeah, but at this point, again, 15,000 unscheduled megawatts of crisis on a regular basis, I'm willing to take as many ideas as possible. We can deliver power quickly. I, see, I think what, what we should do, we should reimagine solutions. Anything I, and I was everything. About, I was about to ask whether you're very stuck in a particular perspective. Yeah. If, you, you, if you take that route of saying, let's take everything that needs to be done and get it done, where we reimagine and we become very scope, you know, panoramic, 
rather than being very you know uh, you know very small myopic, focus myopic yeah. in our view if we do that you're going to open up an entire incredible you know plethora of opportunities and opportunities that can make everyone in their streams quite happy and even much more you know willing to work together but this whole instant constant conflict between the sources is a problem right now in south africa one source which opposes the other source because they want a market share they want to fight each other is causing us a problem that is why our irp is not implemented because it's all based on sources competition like for instance coal competing with gas gas competing with nuclear uh, nuclear nuclear competing with uh, solar solar competing with wind all of them they're all competing by the way but, uh, even fuels am so, i am i silly sorry mm. am i am i very ignorant or didn't the irp doesn't it show that there are pieces of the pie for each for of everybody, those but there's no need to compete because no, everybody not wants everyone to is, compete and but stop no, the other but not one of those solutions will provide all the power for South Africa. Thank you. So let everyone contribute okay, into the that's basket. That's what I'm thinking. And I think and nuclear is part of that. A a nu nu of solutions. Nuclear is not part of it in the next two years. That's all I'm saying. Okay. It's not part the of it in the next time, two years. See, remember in energy, the, the timeline is not the problem. It's it is the problem. It is the problem. When we're talking low shedding, we're talking about an immediate crisis that needs to be solved yes. now. It's like you're stuck with a car in the middle of somewhere. Yes. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to fix that car to get you to the destination. Correct. That's what low shedding is. Fix the car to get you to the destination. Yes. What we're talking about is new solutions going forward. Right. I've brought the car to my destination. Then what do I do for my planning going forward? That's right. what it is about energy. So Which is holistic. what I'm saying is let every solution be brought to the table. Let government in its own openness on what they have done in bringing about the RP. Say to everybody, guys, we're going to stop this bickering among all of you. Okay, our focus is going to be driving this implementation. We said coal, we said nuclear, we said uh, renewables, solar, wind, we said battery storage. Now we want players interested in fulfilling those particular segments that we have already delineated, and let's move fast in the pace and get it done. This bickering has to end and stop. It's so boring. I get tired anymore now. I, I don't take any interviews, by the way, because oh, man, it's so horrible. You're here. You repeat the same thing. Yeah. You know, you get cold for low shedding. What an redundant you know topic to talk about when we know the problems are not Correct. created are actually you know sort of engineered yes. to cause about the situation but right now our focus as a country is bring in all those solutions and drive them but at the same time make sure that your bedrock is in place and that's okay. what will solve most of the problem the leadership and all of those things they know most of them where the issues are i mean when they put a doctor or who's not even interested a medical expert in another field and they put him onto the head of escom he says i was surprised when i was appointed to be you know the uh, chairman of the board and do that but i accepted the role because it's coming out of leadership mm -hmm. the man is humble enough to accept that he's not actually interested in energy he never even made a, a squabble about it so those are the issues for the last two years that should have been done if they could maybe even change the mandate of ESCOM, move it from DPE, place it in Department of Minerals and Energy. You might have a different spark in energy happening, but right now, these things are all hanging in the air. Everybody else is squabbling about things that don't make sense. Right now, all you need is get all the solutions to the table and make them work. And you will see energy space opening up like you have in other economic markets globally around the world. And that is not happening in South Africa. We're always bickering about one faction opposing the other. It's like this damn politics on a daily basis. One minority opposes the majority leading leading party. The other majority leading party opposes the minority. And we never get anywhere in building the country. Right now, you need to build this country. We need all the energy sources. They bring about opportunities. They bring about innovation. They bring about technology. They bring about research. They bring about capital into our markets. And they create what we want to see. I believe in renewables. I, I, I'm, I'm one of those earlier people who adopted some of these technologies and solutions. But I understand energy fundamentals. And those energy fundamentals are fixed. You cannot change them out of will and wish. And if we want to go the route that some people are saying, just remove everything else, have only solar and wind. No, nobody nobody is saying that. Let's be fair. Let's yeah. be fair. I'm nobody telling is saying you, this that. is the views in the market. To say no, South no. Africa no, is wasting time in energy yeah. sources around coal. That is a misleading view. We need coal and we're going to need it for years to come. We need nuclear, okay. and we're going to need it for years to come. If we can grow our nuclear base as well and make it even far much more greater, we would have even much more security on energy side of it. Okay. Whether SMR is ready or not, SMR is used in other technologies such as your right. ships, uh, your, what, what do you call it, uh, uh, your, your, your submarine uh, yes. technology and many other technologies. So
So I think your point is made, Adil, that many voices need to come. You, you to have the table. to have multiple solutions. Certainly, and to that's solve the and that's why we've got all three of you from various uh, disciplines bringing that uh, perspective forward. I I must emphasise at no point in my very lay conversations about energy have I ever heard anybody want to decimate coal altogether nor um, say that, 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 that renewables are the only way forward, particularly on that ability to have 24-hour power. But I think this conversation is a huge first step um, in trying to find a solution that's workable for all of us. Um, Chris Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. I hope, I hope you'll join us again. Same to you, Don Wills, and of course to you, Adil Chabeling. Thank you. Um, thank you for all three of you for your very emphatic perspectives. And thank you again for joining us on Refila's Roundtable. This is clearly round one of round table because there's a lot that's not settled today uh, but that's how robust conversation and solutions for a country come together um, and we look forward to eventually the end of load shedding but uh, certainly a clear way forward uh, in terms of uh, implementing uh, the integrated resource program.